It's a real pleasure to be invited to such an interesting event and it is also very heartening to see an industry such as the horticultural industry grabbing the sustainability issues by the scruff of the neck uh, because I, there are probably very few industries that are so uh, intrinsically connected with the environment, with biodiversity and so forth as horticulture. So ultimately if you guys can't grab the, this particular issue and look to do something about it then uh, we have got a few problems as a planet but it's great that we have these discussions coming along today and I look forward to sharing a few ideas with you. Okay, so I thought we'd start with uh, sort of a kind of quote that wakes everybody up first thing in the morning. Uh, this is a quote from someone called Sally Nex writing in the Royal Horticultural Society magazine The Garden and was published just a few weeks, weeks ago and Sally says, we reach for plastic unthinkingly as post-war gardeners once reached for nicotine and DDT. So this is the kind of scale of issue that uh, many people are beginning to think that plastic is. It's something that's in the same kind of uh, um, scale of problem as issues you know, to do with agrochemicals that were once used, as Sally puts it, unthinkingly, and obviously smoking. I'm sure we've got a few smokers in the room, but uh, many of us now know that the problems it causes. But think how long it took for the public information and the legislation to work um, in order for these kind of changes to occur in societal behaviour, in terms of legislation and so forth. But I think also the quote gives us a, a bit of a sense of hope in the sense that these are issues that were raised, the science came along, showed some of the facts, and then public behaviour legislation and so forth has changed so that um, you know, better decisions can be made you know, for health and the environment. Now, plastic has been um, bubbling under for many years as, as a major issue, but as we know, really exploded as a prime time front page news item, a real priority within sustainability debates in the last couple of years. Thanks um, largely, of course, to the disturbing imagery which was featured in David Attenborough's Planet 2 TV series. Um, now, the discussions and debates in today's conference will hopefully shed some light on what all this means for those involved in the horticultural sector. Now, my aim this morning is to provide some context to discussions about plastic, because I think it's very important that we always take all these issues and not just look at them in isolation, but think, well, how do they fit into the broader, bigger context? What are the sustainability issues within which plastic um, needs to be considered? Because then you can think about the most holistic solutions that are going to produce meaningful change, and it's meaningful change that actually shifts the scientific boundaries that, that is what is required with these, these uh, particular issues. So the key issues within my presentation will be as follows. First of all, plastic cannot be looked at in isolation. The challenges are part of the broader sustainability field. Understanding the sustainability impacts of plastic helps us to guide us to find appropriate solutions. Secondly, it's complicated. There are so many types of plastic, as I'm sure we all know, not just in business lives, but in our personal lives, and particularly if you're a UK citizen, um, trying to cope with the uh, recycling facilities that were offered by our local councils can leave you quite baffled, particularly if you move from one area to another and suddenly things that you could recycle in, you know, in your previous home, you now can't recycle or you've got to put in a different bin. You are standing there shuffling pieces of plastic. You know, it's a complicated business. Um, you know, and that is a, a reality, but one maybe that also needs to be challenged. Legislation and infrastructure for managing plastic are com complex and maybe often unsuited to some of the changes that, that are needed. But there are real opportunities. The pendulum is swinging towards sweeping changes within the whole field of plastics. And so this is why these kind of discussions are really important for bringing those things uh, forward. So let's just go back in time a little bit and just ask ourselves, so why did people start talking about environment? Why did people start talking about uh, um, this word sustainability? So if we go back just over 50 years, um, environmental awareness moved into the mainstream at the back end of the 1960s and the early 1970s. Seminal events at that time included the moon landing, where for the first time ever, you know, our planet was put into its broader context and people realised that we live on a finite planet, maybe though within an infinite universe, but that is finite. What you see there is, is all there is. And not only that, from space you can also um, 
see the individual features, you know, oceans and forests and deserts. And as we've seen over those 50 years, you can start running um, time cycles of, of photos from space and see how the respective land areas of these features have changed. Often, I'm afraid to say for the worst, the big desertification debates, for example, of the 1980s when um, these, these different kind of photographic maps were being looked at. And of course, one of the features, just to bring it on, uh, on message for today, that can be seen from space with a little magnification, is Almeria's Sea of Plastic, southern Spain, an area of greenhouses growing um, a lot of vegetables and so forth for, for markets across Europe. Okay, and that's a reminder of, of why we're here today. Okay. So, back to the movement and how it evolved. A couple of seminal texts came out in the, uh, the late 60s, early 70s. Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, um, which was titled to evoke the loss of species. And then the Club of Rome's book, The Limits to Growth, which was uh, running computer models. Imagine what computers were like in those days. Very interesting algorithms and so forth. Very complex. A lot of writing things out by hand. But the idea was to show that the world had finite resources and the rate that human beings were using using them was just not compatible with the resources that were available. And lots of doomsday scenarios were, were brought up in this particular text, um, which I think it's now sold to like 16 million copies or something, so it shows its impact uh, continues to be major. So a powerful movement began to coalesce, promoting the importance of the natural environment uh, within which we live and drawing attention to the negative impacts of the human pursuit of economic growth. Now, this word uh, sustainability, it's quite, quite a funny word. Well, we have, many of us now accept it as uh, a normal part of the daily lexicon. And yet, if you go back 35 years or so, um, it just wasn't used in this context whatsoever. And uh, I've done some work in South Africa where we've needed to talk about sustainable harvesting of wild flowers. And it's been required of us to translate the guidelines into different languages. And one of the immediate discoveries we had was there was just no word for sustainability. The concept doesn't even exist within many cultures. And um, we had this uh, guy, who's, um, an African guy, who speaks a language called Izzy Corsa, and he had to do the translating. And just to translate the word sustainability took about two sentences to make it make sense. Now, it does make sense, ultimately, but it's just a very different mindset. So we have to think about the language that we use as well and exactly what it means. But where did sustainability, why did it ping to prominence? Well, it was very much out of the, uh, the Brundtland Report, uh, which was published in 1987, uh, which talked about our collective future and the, and the need to actually think about you know, how future generations were going to exist on the planet. And this is where the, the definition that we all accept today of sustainability emerged. Sustainable development being development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. And really, when any organisation or individual is thinking about their sustainability the sustainability of their actions or developing a business plan or whatever, ultimately, that's kind of like the key message that should run through it. You know, what are we doing now and will that have a negative effect or a positive effect on the future? It's quite a simple definition, but very, very powerful. Um, from there, the concept has evolved, um, so it's now widely accepted to be about more than just the natural environment, and that's, again, been a very important part of the broader movement. Sustainability isn't just about being a greenie, as it were, but also being someone who just thinks about the whole economy and society. And I think we're all now familiar with the sustainable development goals, uh, which focus upon economy, society and government. And we know that these uh, goals have become increasingly integrated into government and corporate policies around the world. Integral to the um, SDGs is the notion that true sustainability should focus upon the three Ps. People, planet and uh, profit in any order you happen to choose, all right? The whole idea is there's no priority list here. It's the three. You do not have sustainability unless you've actually got all three things in operation. And that's been, one, one of, again, one of the key debates. You know, there is no sustainability if just people and profit are in balance, but the environment isn't. True sustainability lies right in the intersection of the three circles. And if your work is not achieving that, then you cannot truly call it sustainable. And that, again, is one of the, the key ideas that's been uh, developed. You can't say, well, we're largely one thing and doing a little bit of another, 
and we're sustainable. It's actually about how do the three things balance together, which is very, very important. Um, okay. Now, sustainability is widely integrated into public policies across the world and also business planning and reporting. Taking account of sustainability is, one, is, uh, one, is pretty much now a given for many businesses and its application is believed to play an important role in ensuring the prof profitability, productivity and resilience of a firm. Now, the, the research, particularly in academia and business schools and so forth, is now getting quite sophisticated in terms of saying, you know, what... How do sustainable actions actually benefit the business? And this is some of the work I've been involved with, um, talking to people in businesses about how they're you know, meeting the three Ps, how it actually benefits their business in a broader sense. And the notions of resilience and productivity are increasingly coming up. And the relationships between different activities and those positive outcomes for business are also uh, been looked at. Now, much of my research has been in South Africa over the last 20 years, where I've spent time working with the flower sector to the fruit sector and the wine sectors. Um, and last year I was involved in a team producing an online training course for people working in those industries to help people working in the industries understand sustainability as a concept a lot better and to try and put it into the context of what it means if you're working in fruit, flowers or wine or whatever. Um, and the short video extract I'm about to play is interesting as as we've taken it from the course, this is interviews we did with you know, real life business people who are having to do the, the work every day. And they're talking about how they think about sustainability in the daily operations of their business. Okay, so we've got a couple of minutes now, uh, some people involved in uh, the fruit industry and mainly the flower industry in South Africa, talking about sust what sustainability means to them. Let's hope it works. Sustainability is quite a broad term, building the planet first, so all of the earth and the resources that come from the earth, like the soil and the water, to build a society, so the people that live on the, on the earth and use the resources, and then feeding into an economy. So looking after all three of those, people, planet, and then profit, in a way that allows for future generations to carry on. I started this thing in the business and I said everything should be have the triple bottom line. So we looked at people, planet and a product or profit. And we realized that sustainability fits on all of those things and it just makes a business stronger. Profitability is a given and being active in the other areas underpins and helps uh, provide a foundation for that profitability. So whether it's staff retention or staff well-being or water management then those contribute towards the profitability. The sustainability initiative and drive is, is vital to mark the responsible marketing of a product as well. And we find that once customers understand that there are these components to the products we sell, they buy into it and they appreciate it. As a food business, I think we have a role to play in supporting the environment. Um, starting from understanding the impact in our own operations as well as in our supply chains. Sustainability is, is really for us part of our DNA, it's part of everything what we do. We can't just all day just look at the balance sheet or the profit and loss. Um, it's not going to be sustainable. We need to look at people and we need to look at planet. We as farmers, as agriculture, are so much more uh, dependent on so many resources to be sustainable. So we need to look what we do today. We need to look at our topsoil, we need to look at our drainage, quality of our water, our rivers. Um, if we don't do this, it's going to be a very short journey and a lot of our investment is long term. The whole sustainability drive is a, is a global expectation. We find from all of our customers overseas and even locally that sustainability has to be part of the core values of your business. We'll, we give preferential procurement to suppliers who are on the sustainability journey with us. Okay, well I hope you found some points of interest within those comments from these uh, entrepreneurs out in South Africa, um, all of whom are you know, incredible business people, which is why we brought them into uh, you know, this particular project. But I think what, what's interesting within there is you're getting different dimensions. You know, you've got uh, Bayers, Bayers talking about the uh, 
um, impacts, you know, how you've got to actually manage your resource so that you can produce your flowers. You know, if you're not looking after your soil, you're not looking after your water, uh, particularly in their case where, you know, you're very reliant upon natural resource flows, um, you know, you've got problems ahead. You've then got Anthony uh, from Intaba is talking about the market and what the market expects of them and so forth, you know, and Anthony uh, does supply into the UK, but they also supply Woolworths who are a leading uh, top-end retailer in South Africa who very have very high uh, sustainability credentials and we'll be um, hearing a little bit more about those in a moment. So that's, you know, the, the perspective of real people doing the real thing on the ground and having to make a profit um, in order to survive. So let's go back to uh, sustainability. You know, why has sustainability as an issue gained such um, reach and prominence? Well, here we have one of, you know, if you're going to talk about sustainability as an academic, you've got to have a scary graph with things going upwards and some red shading and so forth just to make things look really, really awful. So here's my contribution to that particular uh, trend. Um, you know, I mean, simply put, though, the extent of challenges, the planet and the species on it, um, you know, where we're at... Um, you know, is basically judged now by most analysts to be a crisis. There are many dimensions to this crisis in terms of soil, in terms of water, in terms of air, and of course the overarching spectre of um, climate change. Uh, now, climate change, you know, is pretty much accepted uh, by most scientists now that it's a given, that you're actually not just a given as a fact, but it's given that there'll be a 1.5 degree uh, rise in temperature um, in the very near future. You know, the latest predictive models uh, coming out are showing that the 1.5 point will be reached a lot sooner than had been predicted just a few years earlier. Um, and you're probably looking at two degrees. Now, two degrees if you live in the UK or Holland, you probably think, well, fine, make life a little bit warmer. But actually, it's the, uh, the impact upon the systems that drive the weather that are so problematic. It totally alters the dynamics of weather systems and tends to produce you know, shifts in where the jet stream occurs and when the jet streams move, then all kinds of chaos is evoked because different types of weather system will start occurring in other places and in a much more intense form. And every time we get a global natural disaster, there's always a debate, is it caused by climate change or not? Well, it hardly matters whether you can actually prove the link for any given thing. The point is the, the temperature is going up and all the science indicates that that is going to create more and more problems. And certainly as horticulturalists, what you're going to be able to grow in different environments will shift. And in South Africa, in the Western Cape, which I'm sure many of you know is a wonderful uh, area for growing fruit, um, horticultural products, um, there are real concerns. People in the last couple of decades are seeing major shifts in what you can grow where. You know, literally just having to move further around the mountain or further up the mountain or whatever to grow different crops, um, you know, which is highly problematic. Okay. So what this has led is to the current era in the planet's history being named the Anthropocene, meaning the time period during which human activity has been the dominant influence on climate and the environment, um, which is uh, quite, a, quite an achievement, really, for, for one particular species to manage that. But whenever one looks at these kind of graphs, you know, it, it, and you look over the long time periods, over you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years, it is quite astonishing to see the changes that have occurred literally in a couple of hundred years. You know, it's, and then the projections as to what's going to happen going forward are even uh, more significant. So we talk about the human touch. Well, there are a uh, few things that better capture the human touch than plastics. And plastics are very much part of the sustainability crisis. Uh, you know, we, are, we just all accept plastics are part of our everyday life, okay? But what are they exactly? Well, there are a wide range of synthetic or semi-synthetic materials used in a huge and growing range of applications. Um, you know, they can be organic materials um, like wood, paper, um, or coal. The raw materials used to produce plastics are natural products such as cellulose, coal, natural gas, salt, and of course crude oil. And then, you know, the chemical engineers get involved and uh, produce these, these amazing substances that are of great practical use. Everywhere you look, you will find plastics these days. You know, we use plastic products to make our lives cleaner, easier, safer, and more enjoyable. We find Plastics in the clothes we wear, the houses we live in and the cars we travel in, the, the toys our children play with, the televisions we watch and so forth. Everything contains plastics. 
They're used right across the economy, packaging, construction, transportation, healthcare, electronics. Roughly 15% of the weight of a modern car is plastic, which is you know, quite an astonishing thing. You know, the first time you have a little bumper crash um, a few years ago and you realise it actually it's not some bit of steel that's uh, been dented, it's actually a piece of plastic. You know, it's, it's quite a moment to realise that um, infiltration into everything. And of course, plastic's you know, low cost, it's versatile, it's durable, it's got great strength to weight ratio, many, many positive qualities. But again, we have another scary graph, and on this occasion, this is showing plastic production over the last, um, you know, since 1964. Plastic production globally has gone up 20-fold, okay, 20-fold to over 300 million tonnes, and is expected to double by 2035 and quadruple by 2050. Okay, you know, th those are incredible statistics to think about. You know, those are the trends we're all working within. So, plastics and sustainability. Well, first of all, the good news. Um, you know, I mean, there are good things about plastics, obviously. You know, that's why they're so integrated. They're lighter than alternative options, so have a lower carbon footprint. So, you know, that's very much a, a positive. Um, they also have barrier properties, which is why they're used in food packaging and so forth. And, of course, those barrier properties help to reduce food waste, which, again, is another sustainable sustainability positive. So it's not all uh, negative in terms of plastics and the sustainability um, issues. You know, there are definite positives as well to a considerable extent. But then we get into the problems, and this is really about how humans use and create systems around plastics. 95% of plastic packaging material value is lost after its first use. Okay. Only 14% of plastic packaging globally is collected for recycling, 14%, with additional losses in sorting and reprocessing, meaning that only 5% of uh, the final value is um, maintained for future use. Okay. And the, one of the problems with recycling, you know, we often are told recycling is a solution to many things, but... Um, Often things that usually are recycled into lower value applications and often are only recycled once. So it's really just slowing the problem. It's not preventing it. 72% okay. of plastic packaging is not recovered at all, which again is a very significant issue. 40% landfilled, another 32% leaks out, as they say, in other ways. So what are the types of impact that we get from plastics? You know, what, you know, again, this is all part of understand the problem, because when you understand the problem, you can work out what solutions you actually need. And the problem has varying dimensions. I mean, to me, the most significant is the contribution to climate change. You know, the plastic industry uses about 6% of the world's oil production, um, which is equivalent to the oil production of the global aviation sector. And it is predicted that the plastic sector could account for 20% of total consumption of oil by 2050. So that contribution to greenhouse gases, to climate change, which is the biggest threat of all, is very, very significant. And greenhouse gas emissions result from production and after-use incineration as well. Um, in 2012, uh, emissions from production and after-use pathways amounted to 390 million tonnes of CO2. And it's predicted that the plastic sector will account for 15% of the global carbon budget by 2050, um, you know, which is obviously very significant. Environmental health, yes, go back to um, you know, Blue Planet 2 and so forth. You know, the degradation of, of natural systems as a result of the leakage of plastic, especially the ocean. And again, the statistics, the ratio of fish in, in the ocean by weight um, currently is, uh, you know, one to five plastics to fish. But that's predicted to even up to one to one by 2050. I'm not even sure whether they're taking into account the amount of plastic the fish have ingested in that as well, because that would uh, alter that equation to something even, even worse. At least 8 million tonnes of plastic leak into the oceans each year. Okay. You know, so that's a very significant impact. And that's not just an environmental impact, something for the green people to worry about. It has economic costs. You know, the costs of clear up the impacts on fishing industries and so forth. We can see there that uh, you know, the cost of tourism, fishing and shipping in the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation region is worked out at being about $1.3 billion a year. So it's very significant impact. Health, you know, there's still a lot of research to be done on exactly what impacts plastic has upon all our health. Um, 
But this comes from what they call substance, you know, I love this phrase, substances of concern, it says in the literature, which are within plastics. These are the additives uh, which can contain impurities and contaminants. And it's known that when plastic is burnt, these are released. But as I say, still much more research needs to be done on those particular outcomes, but it's definitely there as a problem. So attitudinal shift, the blue planet effect. You know, there's been a marked shift in attitudes to plastic since the broadcasting of Sir David Attenborough's series. Plastic was propelled from the pack of issues we were all as citizens supposed to be concerned about, and it was put right to the forefront. Images of whales and turtles and birds and fish battling with plastic in their daily lives brought home the horror of human beings' lack of environmental stewardship. It was so bad that even the UK politicians promised action, which these days you can probably realise takes something, although we also know they're very good at saying they're going to do one thing and never doing it. But Michael Gove was running around the day after seeing a whale dying horribly um, on, on the programme and said action would occur. So uh, we'll have to make him follow up on that if he does become our leader. And consumers have become more... Be something you could so consumers have become more critical of plastic usage. And how does this translate into their actions? The good old consumer... Uh, us. Um, now, cons consumers, you know, much of the data here is, that I'm going to be quoting is either UK or European, done from uh, market research company uh, work. But certainly plastic, plastic and packaging issues have really risen up the agenda of concern for consumers. So amongst one survey done by Mintel uh, indicated that uh, nearly three quarters of European grocery shoppers believe that uh, retailers use too much plastic in their uh, packaging. 64% uh, think retailers should do more to educate consumers. 66% uh, agree it's appealing to, sh to shop with a grocery retailer which was pledged to cut down on plastic usage. So the consumers are starting to, uh, to get with it to some degree. Um, and in a UK poll, 55% said they would choose to shop at a supermarket which does not overpackage products. And we're definitely starting to see these trends in terms of how uh, the retailers are, are responding um, to, the, to these particular opportunities. But the problem with us, you know, we're all consumers, is we're very fickle, I'm afraid to say. You know, and all the marketing people do their research. There are different categories of consumers. So you'll always get your consumer activists, you know, the small percentage who will never do, in their view, the wrong thing, and other people who will try and do the right thing, um, you know, and then probably the rest of us. <laughs> but we tend to follow trends rather than create them. And ultimately, convenience and price tend to be the key for changing people's habits. Okay. So what about the retailers? Are they leading the way? Well, most retailers, and I say most, not all, most UK at least retailers have um, policies on plastic. Okay? Uh, Tesco, for example, says it's going to reduce um, packaging, make it recyclable or compostable by 2025, all of it. Uh, Sainsbury's are going to reduce their own brown packaging by 50% by 2020. In South Africa, as I mentioned earlier, Woolworths, they have a suite of policies because the, the particular consumer market they're driving at. They want all packaging to be either reusable or recyclable um, in three years' time and to phase out single-use plastic bags by next year. And just to bring the horticultural theme in, here's a, a bunch of proteas um, sold by Woolworths, which I picked up a couple of years ago. Um, notice no packaging on it at all, no cellophane. Uh, the label is a nice piece of recycled cardboard, which is attached with string, not with plastic. And it's all part of their, you know, let's make all this very sustainable and environmental. And if you look at the marketing, it's linked to the sale of the indigenous, you know, product as well, the local indigenous product. So, you know, they're playing very much a marketing game there. But there's a very definite effort with that particular product line to be showing what can be done. But as I'm sure some of you know, with proteas, they, they're a little bit hardier than most flowers, so they, you can sort of get away without necessarily protecting them with packaging wrap in the way that maybe you can't with some others. But it's an interesting step forward, an interesting initiative to, to do that. And it was nice for once to buy some flowers and not then have to work out what on earth you do with this wrap you just no longer need and you know nothing to do with it, as it were. Looking through retailer um, policies in the UK, what struck me very much is how different they all are. There's, you know, they, they all pick out different things they're going to focus on. Are they going to go for biodegradable? Are they going to be, is it only going to be own brand stuff they focus on? They all have different time frames. Um, you know, some focus on plastic bags, some don't. So there's, there's lots of 
interesting things there, but it's also worrying. Really, this should be joined up, a joined up approach to this stuff would be much more sensible um, so that ideas and innovation can be, sh can be shared. Now, plastics in horticulture, um, a business for you guys. Yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, plastic's integral to everything that you do, um, all the way from production through to consumption. Uh, best known examples being the use of plastic sheeting um, for, uh, for greenhouses, you know, the infamous sea of plastic, Almeria again. And it's got a little example for you here which shows the, the double thinking of retailers, okay? This is a farm in South Africa. Uh, I took this picture 12 months ago. Um, and this is, a, I think he's a plum producer. And those poles are going in the ground because the retailer have instructed the producer to put plastic sheeting over the orchards they're planting to avoid sun marks on the fruit. Now, according to the producer, this will have no impact whatsoever on quality. It's purely a visual appearance issue. So the retailer, who ha this particular retailer, has very high standards, they claim, in all their literature around sustainability, are forcing something to be done which costs the producer money, which I'm sure is something you would all uh, appreciate is not the greatest thing, for no improvement in price, for no improvement in quality apart from appearance, and with a massive sustainability footprint as well, because that whole area now will be covered in plastic four metres off the ground or whatever. Um, so, you know, double think re with retailers and, of course, consumers, because why are consumers bothered about the odd small brown mark that shows the sun has actually got near your product? Um, other issues, well, yeah, we're going to hear more about this. The black plastic conundrum, pots and trays are obviously integral to everything that the, your, your industry does. Um, but the, the black tray, uh, pots and trays in particular, as you know, are very problematic because of the problems in terms of recycling them um, and so forth. But look at the numbers again. You know, in the UK, three to four hundred million plastic pots go to landfill or incineration every year. Um, and only 9 out of 75 UK councils offer proper recycling facilities. So again, as a consumer, um, you stand there just baffled as to what exactly you're supposed to, supposed to do. Um, but of course, there are innovators, and there are some in the room today, um, pushing out solutions, you know, non-black plastic pots, biodegradable trays and packaging and so forth. So for every problem, there's somebody looking for the business opportunity to create the, uh, the solution. But the challenge is, again, we get back to this thing, it's complicated. You know, what can be recycled? Can it be recycled efficiently? Can it be recycled in your area? You know, it's quite easy to get disheartened around some of these issues. And innovations do not, I'm afraid to say, always solve the biggest problems of all. Um, for example, some degradable plastics, which sound great, you know, you can say, we're selling degradable plastics. But, you know, you've then got to dispose of them, um, you know, properly. Um, which is fine if you've got the facilities to do that. But those degradable plastics can also create greater emissions and take a longer time to break down. So they have other sustainability issues attached to them, which maybe weren't thought about or realised at the point of de design. Depends very much on the products concerned. Um, consumers like the idea of degradable pots. But consumers don't like it when those pots break easily. And I had exactly that uh, experience the other week buying some uh, bedding plants in a UK supermarket. Very thin plastic trays. Obviously, they're trying to reduce the, uh, the amount of plastic used. And as I walked out of the store, the plastic snapped and scattering peat, or well, hopefully not peat, maybe compost, and flowers all over the entrance to Asda in rugby. Um, and it also led to some very inappropriate language for the family walking behind me, but never mind. But uh, these things do affect you as a consumer, you know, you, you, it doesn't make your life easy and I'm afraid we've all got very pampered and we expect everything to work easily for us. Um, now let's have a little look at some of the, the bigger drivers towards alternatives. As I'm sure many of you know, you know, the a big organisation doing a lot of work in these, this sphere is the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, who are driving the new plastics economy, um, which is demonstrated on, on this screen. And there's some absolutely brilliant work being done in collaboration with many organisations, businesses, governments, and so forth, to really push what they call the new plastics economy, um, where the key features include creating an effective 
after-use plastic economy, drastically reducing the leakage of plastic into natu natural systems, and crucially as well, decoupling plastic from fossil feedbacks, you know, using renewably sourced feedstocks. Thus, you have your reuse, recycle, and renewable. This time, the three R's. All right, so we're moving through the alphabet. We've had three P's, now we're on to the three R's. But these are absolutely essential. Now, and then the virgin feedstock thing is critical. What this basically means is use less oil all right, in the process. Because um, the threat is huge. You know, even if global recycling rates rise by 50% in the next 30 years, the amount of virgin feedstock required will still double. Okay? So that's the amount of oil that will be needed. And our dear friends, the petrochemical companies, of course, are looking at their future business plans. They realise that... Um, um, Oil-based products as fuels are, are under threat for varying reasons and are really investing in plastics at, uh, for, for the future going forward. So there's going to be a big push for them from them in terms of plastic products in order to keep their multi-billion dollar uh, industries going. Now options for decoupling include developing renewable sources such as converting greenhouse gases, I don't know how the engineers do this but they do, converting CO2 and methane uh, into plastics. Now one of my colleagues is involved in the biomass to um, plastics work uh, and there's work going on in this country, Holland and the East China Sea region to experiment with seaweed um, as an alternative source for plastic manufacturer and products are reaching the, the marketplace such as biodegradable cups which pass the shelf life gap test, another, another concept to learn for today which is the time difference between the life expectancy of the product i.e. when we'll use it and the life of the container that product came in. So with some things, you know, it may be a matter of hours or days that the product is in the container, but the container itself may take several hundred years to degrade. So what we're trying to do is reduce that uh, shelf life gap. And a lot of research is going on, for example, seaweed farming at scale, you know, um, is, is a very interesting concept. The after-use economy, it's vital to capture more uh, material value and reduce leakage into natural systems. Uh, only, as we said before, only 5% of the material value of plastics is captured post-use. This is a resource that's wasted. You know, it needs to be used. Uh, we need improved recycling, better technologies for doing this, and a lot more cross-supply chain coordination um, so that people are talking to each other at different points in the supply chain about who needs what, in what form, and what can be done with with those particular things, a much greater coordination and standardisation, um, you know, which can go against businesses looking for their own unique selling points, but some problems are too big to worry about doing something that's unique to you. This is about the bigger picture here. Um, all right, well, that bit. Now, the research and experimentation is key. You know, uh, I, I would suggest everybody has a look at the, uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation website, The New Plastics Economy. You may well find ideas that are, are relevant to you. Research is going to be crucial, and that research needs to be multidisciplinary. We need our physical scientists who understand all the strange chemical components of, of plastics and the alternatives. We need en engineers to look at how these products can then be developed and put into practice. And we need social scientists and supply chain practitioners us to look at the practicalities, what will happen with some of these products when human beings are actually involved in using them. Because uh, obviously what can look great in the lab does not always translate well into, an, into the, uh, the environment things are used in. Um, just very quickly, just um, this is an, an example someone uh, talked to me about the other day, small scale flower growers, you know, the challenges they produce. I was at a conference uh, three weeks ago in Cumbria in the UK where florists were talking about the challenges they face to be sustainable. Um, and these are some of, the, some of the issues they brought up, you know, in, the, in terms of plastics. You know, you're a small-scale grower, you haven't got a huge turnover, your profit margins are relatively tight. You need to use plastics for sheeting, polytunnels, pots, packaging, wrapping, and so forth. You know, they all play, a, it all plays a crucial role in what you do. But if you want to be more sustainable, you know, what are your options? And how do you know, as an individual, whether those options are actually making a meaningful contribution to sustainability, or are they just actually a nice marketing ploy or you know just a good product but actually doesn't hit tick all the bigger boxes in in terms of um you know the sustainability impact so for example you find you know recycled pots which sounds great but then if once those pots have been used they can't be recycled again well what happens to them 
You know, um, you know th those kind of, of issues come up. So some of the innovations and responses that have been seen, um, there we have the biodegradable pots, we have bulbs and seeds in cardboard and recycled packaging, biodegradable eco-wrap, uh, recycled plastic pots. There's lots of ideas, there's lots of options, options going on out there. And what's really heartening is to see the evidence of innovation and change and response to the market. And what was particularly heartening was listening to people saying, no, this stuff matters. We really do want to make a difference and, and change practices, and our consumers are, are interested in this. So, heading towards the, uh, the summary, um, plastics is a sustainability issue. Always think about the three Ps, all right? People, planet, and profit. But we have to think of um, the, the carbon footprint, the climate change issues as the absolute imperative. This is the biggest problem of all. And what impact does any change in plastics use or production actually make to that particular problem? All right. Um, you know, it's not just a moral or aesthetic problem we're talking about. We're talking about damage to the economy. We're talking about social well-being. Okay. Um, consumers are broadly on side, you know, but at the end of the day are fickle. You know, we, fi we, we consumers, you know, we want uh, convenience, we want good price, um, and, and those kind of things first and foremost. You know, we're often contrary. Um, you know, we will change our, our patterns of behaviour, but often when we're led to it, you know, which is where the plastic bag thing um, came in. At the end of the day, people, we all knew that we shouldn't be using plastic bags, but how many of us took action until the supermarket started charging um, and so forth? You know, it takes, you know, we're often grudgingly led by legislation and price. Um, you know, convenience, practicality and value often come first. But once people get on the bandwagon, they suddenly become very enthusiastic. So that's something to, to go for. Um, the status quo isn't acceptable. Things do need to change. There's no doubt about that. So we're all very well saying, you know, these are a load of problems. Well, what, what are we all doing? What can we all do? Well, at Coventry University, we've got all kinds of research projects going on um, to understand consumers and their attitudes and responses to sustainability issues and so forth. Uh, my colleague Benny um, is doing a lot of work or looking to do a lot of work in Indonesia around bioplastics using seaweed and cassava as options for, for producing products. Uh, a lot of technical innovation going on and talking with social scientists like me about the real world interface. What will happen when consumers get confronted with a product made from seaweed? You know, will they adopt it? Um, you know, will how they use it affect its own sustainability? And those are big issues. And then lots of work as well going on within supply chains and waste management. So again, these things are really crucial. What is happening within the supply chain with waste? And again, you know, what's happening with corporate policies? Are they being really um, filled through? And what I can say in terms of our work is obviously, um, if anybody was interested in knowing more or wants to get involved in projects, then please let me know because obviously partners who are doing it on the ground are critical to these things. If someone you know, wants to get a research institution involved in any way, we'd be delighted to talk to you and introduce you to the right people um, at Coventry or, dare I say, even another university if they're more, more suitable. So the key thing is we do some stuff about it. And what about you guys? You know, as a producer, an, ind um, an industry, as an individual, what can, you, what can you or what should you be looking to do? Um, yeah, well, lobbying is, is crucial. You know, um, you're an industry, as I say, and as you know, it's connected to nature, to biodiversity and beauty. You know, you've got a strong imperative uh, for actually protecting, you know, these parts of your, uh, your own business. And lobbying decision makers is critical. You know, the decision makers need lobbying or else they just don't do very much. Whether this is at the level of your local council who's dealing with the waste out of, you know, your production unit or whether it's as an individual in terms of your domestic or whatever or as a body, you know, talking about trying to produce more streamlined facilities um, um, generally. Engagement, you know, engage with the debates, which is great that today is happening, you know, and organisations seeking to make change, such as research institutes, think tanks, other lobbying groups. Um, it's important for industries to be at the top table and help to drive change. Don't leave it to others. And as an individual, and as a, again, as an industry, be as informed as you can about these issues. I mean, plastics is very, very technical, and I I don't think anybody could manage to fit all the, all the knowledge that's required into, into their own head, but it's important to know as much as you can so that you can understand uh, whether ideas and innovations are actually going to have a positive uh, impact. 
trial and innovate. You know, give things a go. And it doesn't matter sometimes if things don't work. The key thing is that um, we try to drive things forward, be part of trials, see how consumers respond, feed that information across. Adapt, you know, look at non-plastic alternatives, be prepared to make changes in the way you do things. And crucially, you know, integrate sustainability into your business model. All right? As our South African friends at the, you know, in the video was saying, sustainability is part of what they do. You know, and they all have talked through with me in great detail about how the sustainability things they do improve their business and, and are actually just core to the way that they operate. You know, it's, the, it's something they do, not the way they do something. And uh, that's very important. And I would say, ultimately, don't worry, you know, it sounds slightly mad, but don't worry too much about consumers or even legislation. Because if you're doing the right things, um, those things will take care of themselves, okay? You know, don't get distracted by small measures with little impact. It's the big stuff that matters, okay? That, that would be my suggestion as to the way forward. Okay, thank you very much for listening.